Okay, um, we're going to keep going here. Um, and the next session that we're going to have is around exploring policy solutions to the topic that we've been discussing today. And so I'll invite the, uh, the, nec uh, the next panel is over here, my goodness. Um, so, I, and I'll thank everybody um, on the workplace platform as well, if they're still there, um, but thank them. They're gone, okay, good. Nice to have you guys here. Okay, now then, um, let me uh, bring the next panel up. Come on, Daniel. And I will, um, I will introduce them serially um, as, as, we, as we go. So um, the, next, the next session we have um, really some terrific experts um, in the field. Dr. John Wiesman, uh, Secretary of Health for the Washington State Department of Health. Um, John Auerbach, um, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Trust for America's Health. Um, and Nathaniel Counts, um, Associate Vice President for Policy for Mental Health America. Um, I will was deciding I have a page and a half of introductory notes, so I'm going to do them in little pieces instead of all at once, because I, I think that's a better way to do it. Um, so Dr. Wiesman is going to uh, go first. He was appointed Secretary of Health by Governor Jay Inslee um, and joined the State Department of, of Health in April of 2013, an accomplished transformational leader with more than 22 years of local public health experience and focuses on whole systems approaches um, to improving health serves as a clinical professor at the University of Washington School of Public Health, Department of Health Services, and has held an adjunct faculty appointment at the, this place is supposed to be great, the Evergreen State College. I hear awesome things about that school in particular. Um, but um, also earned uh, a doctor of public health in public health executive leadership from uh, the home of the Tar Heels, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, and his master's in public health and chronic disease epidemiology from Yale University. So. Dr. Wiesman, you're up. Thanks, Thank sir. you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. Great. It, uh, it's approaching afternoon in my time zone in uh, Washington State. Uh, maybe. So it's good to be here with you all, and I want to thank um, everyone who's here. It's amazing to be in this room of uh, experts and who are doing such great work, and to have folks from uh, Kaiser joining us uh, as well. As a Kaiser member, I want to thank you all for the care you do provide me and the amazing research you do um, and the work in uh, policy. As a Secretary of Health, I must say I'm often envious of the work that Kaiser does uh, in terms of your Thrive kinds of uh, uh, health promotion motion work, I'm like, oh, I wish I had that kind of advertising budget. <laughs> so anyway, uh, as Secretary of Health, I do want to say that uh, the best part of my job is being able to talk about work that others have done. And really, um, in this space, I want to thank all those folks in Washington State who have been working in the area of suicide prevention and policy. I'm going to give you a quick background of the situation in Washington, very quickly indeed, um, and then talk a little bit about leadership and uh, public health and suicide prevention, and then go into a couple of policy areas around schools and healthcare provider training uh, and lethal means reduction. So in Washington state, we're very much like uh, the rest of the country, except that our suicide rate is about 22% higher than the rest of the country. Uh, that is also very similar for the Intermountain West states and the Pacific Northwest. Our state population is about 7.5 million, and every day we have about 3.5 suicides a day in our state. Three and a half deaths every day in our state. In terms of the opioid crisis, uh, we lose about two a day in our state. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting uh, that the resources that we, I think, appropriately have put into opioids and that response um, is certainly important and something we should do someday. I would love to see us put the same kind of resources into suicide prevention that we are in that effort. Um, like much of the rest of the country, we do have higher rates in males, uh, young adults, older adults, uh, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, in our rural communities, in our LGBT uh, populations, and especially in the youth in that population. Uh, firearms really have been strongly connected to our suicide prevention work for this reason and the reason on the next slide, which is that half of our suicide deaths are by firearm. Uh, which is much like the rest of the country, as you can see. 
And if you look at all of the firearm deaths uh, in Washington state, 75% of those are suicide deaths, which makes it, I think, really important that from a public health perspective, we think about that, and that is exactly what our governor, um, Jay Inslee, did. So historically, Washington has really focused on preventing suicide among young people aged 10 to 24 years. And then the legislature in 2014 passed House Bill 2315, which asked the Department of Health to actually write a suicide prevention plan, essentially across the lifespan. And then that plan was published in January of 2016. Now, as this plan was being written, um, the governor was very interested in addressing firearm injuries and deaths. There were a number of mass shootings around the country and uh, getting much attention. And so we gladly worked uh, with the governor around this and said, Governor, if we're going to take a data-driven approach to this, we need to understand the role that suicide has here, and that as being sort of the major issue that we need to focus on. So he issued an executive order in uh, January of 2016, which really focused uh, primarily on three things. One was to begin implementing the suicide prevention plan. Um, a second was to look at a gap analysis in looking at the sharing of mandated information between agencies for background check information. We had a past in our state in November of 2014, Initiative 594, which closed the, loop, uh, the background check loopholes um, for all gun sales, including those at gun shows and on the internet. Uh, and so this was an effort to say, hey, where is some of that uh, information that comes from multiple state agencies um, not getting clearly communicated uh, in terms of those background checks? And then the third was asking the attorney general to look at gaps in enforcing laws when people who are prohibited from purchasing or possessing firearms actually attempt to do so. And what are we doing um, about that? So that executive order also had us form uh, an action alliance uh, for suicide prevention, much like the national one that you saw. That was actually our model. So Colleen, thanks for your great work. And it was really developed to help ensure accountability of this uh, plan to ensure uh, progress is accelerated. And when we pulled together this group, I came at it from a place of uh, three sort of uh, common agreements. Um, one was that owning a firearm is a personal choice. Um, and a personal choice that we uh, uh, know is there and want to protect. Secondly, that we all want our families to be safe and protected. We all want our families safe and protected and the people we care about, and that together we want to prevent harm um, and do that together, and that if we found that common ground, we could work um, together. So Washington did develop, um, as I said, the suicide prevention plan, which you can find on our website. That plan focused on four strategic directions, which you can see here around families and communities, com clinical and community uh, preventative services, around treatment, um, and around data and surveillance. Each of those have goals and recommendations that go with those. And they led us to a place where uh, one of the leadership issues that we did is say how as a state across agencies, whether it's the Veterans uh, Department, uh, School of uh, Superintendent of Inst Public Instruction, Children, Youth and Families, all of our state agencies, how do we come together and actually put together a core around um, suicide prevention? And because, frankly, this isn't well-funded. And we get a few dollars from CDC, but they don't go nearly far enough. And each agency has maybe little dollars here and there. So we put together a decision package, as we call it, to say, as state agencies and as state universities, let's come together and think what would be a core. And that core, we said, would be an education campaign to both raise awareness as well as reduce stigma. Uh, to have crisis hotlines that are funded and resources for people uh, that are there when they need them, uh, to have some specialists in these areas around veterans and others high-risk populations, and to have um, local resources in communities that we know um, can actually do good work. Uh, we put forward that plan. It was many millions of dollars more than uh, was going to be funded, and so we're going to keep working on that over multiple years. On the policy side, though, 
um, in addition to policy. Uh, we've focused on higher education. Uh, and back in 2011, there was a bill implemented and passed to have a work group on preventing bullying, uh, intimidation, and harassment, um, and increase students' knowledge of mental health and youth suicide through the learning standards um, in the curriculum. So really starting to take, again, this uh, policy and systems approach in our education settings. And it also had colleges compiling um, this information as well. Uh, that went on to increasing uh, capacity for training for professionals in schools to make sure they had mental health training, that they could help our students uh, in crisis. And you can see a whole laundry list of things um, that have happened uh, since then. I do want to mention that it's important to have champions and important to acknowledge them. One of the champions in our state is Jen Stuber, um, who's a professor at the University of Washington. And um, she is a survivor of her husband's suicide um, and has been one who said, we need to go beyond awareness and think about policy and systems approach changes to restore hope. And she has really done that in this work in helping uh, move along some of these policies, along with Representative Tina Orwall. Uh, it's always important to have those champions for us. And uh, that sort of education uh, that started with school professionals then moved into other education requirements, continuing education requirements for health professionals, starting with mental health professionals, about uh, being able to do suicide assessments, referrals, understand imminent risk um, and access to lethal means and how to help um, protect people. And that then really started a cascade of bills of expanding the continuing education uh, requirements that my agency actually actually um, uh, puts forth. Then we focused a great deal, as you can see as well, on reducing lethal means, as I said from the earlier data. So in 2016, the legislature created the Safer Homes Task Force. This task force was to put together suicide awareness and prevention strategies um, with firearm dealers, firearm range, uh, ranges, with hunter and safety and pharmacies. So it was taking a approach of safe, essentially, uh, storage and homes for both firearms and medications, and really putting those two together to, again, talk about creating safe environments uh, for our folks. Uh, this led, as you can see, to um, other policy issues. Uh, the state did also, voters passed Initiative 594 requiring background checks um, and allowing the temporary transfer of those firearms uh, to others uh, to protect people who might be at risk for suicide. Um, and um, has then led to actual funding of the Safer uh, Home Suicide Aware Program. And one of the unique things, I think, about this is that this effort is co-chaired by Jen Stuber, who I mentioned earlier, Dr. Stuber, and then Alan Gottlieb, who is with the Second Amendment Foundation. We said, if we are going to come together on this and find common ground, and, uh, and work with folks who own firearms uh, and who hunt um, and uh, use firearms for safety reasons, we need to be on common ground and we need to come together. Um, and that's really important to us. Some people have been critical of us that we would um, partner um, with the Second Amendment Foundation, given that on the other policy sides, we don't always see eye to eye on those. Um, but I think it's important to work um, on common ground uh, when we can. And in Washington State, many of these other policies have been passed through um, initiative because those were also things that wouldn't get through the legislature. So in wrapping up, since I'm well over time, um, the other initiatives we're working on is looking at the agricultural industry and suicide risk there, uh, which is uh, the agriculture industry is large in Washington state, um, and it's important for us to understand um, uh, how to best work and prevent suicide there. So I know we'll have time for question and answer later and further discussion of any of these, but I'll just leave you with um, one of the things we do on our action day uh, during the legislature is um, outside the state capitol, uh, put out uh, on our action day 
tombstones uh, representing all of the suicides in Washington state. They are color coded by um, those that died by firearm, uh, those by suffocation, those by poisoning, thus the different colors. And yellow ribbons are put on those for veterans. Um, and this last year, they put backpacks on the ones for young people. So advocacy is an incredibly important when we're in the public policy making area. So thank you very much. Thanks. It's amazingly creative um, and thoughtful work, um, particularly the I know particularly the gun work um, that's been going on. We have seen the need to find a way to change the dialogue, and it's that kind of leadership that I think is really helping us move in, in other directions. Um, so thank you. Um, next up is John Auerbach. He's the president and CEO of the Trust for America's Health, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to saving lives by protecting the health of every community and working to make disease prevention a national priority, uh, former associate director for policy, and the acting director of the Office for State, Tribal, Local, and Territorial Support. I always have to read that very carefully because there's many words in that. Um, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and a distinguished professor of practice in health sciences, and the director of the Institute on Urban Health Research and Practice at Northeastern University in Boston um, from 2012 to 2014. John, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Whoops. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would also add that um, uh, part of what I've done over the course of my career was I was a, a city health commissioner for a decade in Boston, uh, and uh, for several years I was the Massachusetts health commissioner, and so had had the pleasure of working with Dr. Wiesman on on uh, many of the uh, policies that uh, he's implementing in in Washington State. We also looked at in Massachusetts. So my um, emphasis in terms of the talk today would be to suggest that uh, in order to effectively reduce suicide, we have to wor work in uh, coalitions and collaboration with each other. And, and all too often, the sectors that we represent are in silos and not working uh, uh, with each other in an effective way. This pyramid illustrates some of why we need uh, cross-sector work. It's a pyramid that's been used uh, frequently in public health that illustrates that at the top of the pyramid, it's, it's the work that we do on a one-to-one -one basis with a patient to try to screen that patient uh, for risk, as we've been talking about, counsel that patient, and then maybe refer them to uh, specialized services. It is uh, smallest on the top because that work is done one by one, and it's very resource intensive because it means you have to work with a single person, often with a single clinician or multiple clinicians. At the bottom of the pyramid, on the other hand, is changing the conditions, broadly changing the conditions in people's lives, addressing the social determinants like racism, like poverty, that create additional stress and additional um, pressures that make people more vulnerable for suicide. So the trick is not to try to do everything in the sector that you're in, but to understand that to be effective, we've got to be at the same table. And there have to be uh, people from all those different sectors that are working in sync. Uh, Kaiser Permanente, I think, is a perfect example of the recognition of that, because Kaiser Permanente, in addition to providing excellent clinical care, works uh, in a variety of ways in different sectors. Uh, in its philanthropic work, for example, pays for uh, affordable housing and pays for looking at both city and state policies, and I'll give you a couple of examples of those. We're working in Washington to focus on a certain aspect of that work in coalition that often is neglected, and that's what gets referred to as primary prevention or sometimes primordial prevention. And that idea is, is really working even before we're thinking of working in the schools with terrific programs like uh, the Good Behavior Game that build resiliency to trauma and resiliency to difficult circumstances kids have gone into, instead to think about how can we eliminate those conditions from ever occurring in the families and with the um, uh, children and adults that, uh, that may make them later in life at elevated risk. Now, that may seem like too idealistic. Where do you begin? How do you begin to think about those kinds of policies, particularly if you're an, uh, an individual clinician or working in a small practice, even if you're in a large health system? Sometimes those larger social issues can seem between, beyond your control. 
Part of what we do at Trust for America's Health is we look at the evidence base for those broader policies, and we try to gather that in a helpful way so that that can become a resource for you about what are those policies, what are those laws, what are those regulations that would make a difference. We now have a coalition, by the way, called the Wellbeing Working Group, funded by uh, the Wellbeing Trust, uh, a philanthropy on the West Coast, that brings together 25 different national organizations to think about how can we, across sector, work on some of these upstream approaches. A and that means beginning to think about such policies as uh, insurance coverage. You know, we're talking about what happens in terms of good clinical care this morning, but we're still struggling to make sure that every person in the country has access to comprehensive health insurance, high quality comprehensive health insurance with parity. That's key. We can't lose sight of that. That's a policy we need to pay attention to. Um, we also need to pay attention to some of the more controversial uh, policies like gun control. Uh, not because it's a, uh, a, 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 a cause in and of itself, but because if we're um, looking at the science base, the evidence base, and there's certain policies that will be effective in terms of reducing suicides uh, by limiting guns, uh, worth considering. Um, even uh, looking at policies related to discrimination is incredibly important here. That includes such things as looking at the policies around immigration, looking at policies against particular populations like the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender populations, and looking at where we see racism and discrimination creating conditions in people's lives that elevate the, uh, their risk significantly. Now, I'm going to skip over uh, in the interest of time and focus on the question that people may have the most often is, what, how do you do this? So I'll give you some concrete examples. Communities across the nation are developing the concept of trauma-informed agencies and institutions. Many school systems at the school superintendent level, sometimes at the county level or the state level, are embracing the idea of trauma-informed schools. These are schools where the notion is, uh, we, if we find that, that children are, have behavior, behavior problems in the schools, or if something's going on, there's chronic absenteeism, instead of thinking, what's wrong with that child, that the approach is, what has happened in that child's life that we can help to address? These are just two school systems out of many that I've happened to visit where there's not enormous resources. They're not necessarily in the most uh, progressive uh, political um, uh, communities, but they have embraced this approach completely. In Bethlehem, for example, uh, a thousand uh, people moved to Bethlehem, it's only 70,000, from Puerto Rico after the hurricanes uh, that took place last year. And they integrated hundreds of kids through the schools where they noted those kids were experiencing trauma. And working with them realized part of that was the parents needed help in terms of finding jobs, relocating to stable housing. And the whole county got involved in working on addressing those issues as part of the notion of reducing uh, elevated risk. Um, this is also related to the overall efforts in the country that are anti-racist efforts, uh, anti-discriminatory efforts, where we know that uh, also contributing to elevated risk for suicide is when people have uh, a sense of hopelessness or don't see a positive future because of limited uh, educational opportunities or economic opportunities. Uh, this has gotten a lot of attention in the last couple of years with regard to the rural communities, but it's true uh, over a, a wider segment of the population. So paying attention to things like economic opportunities, uh, who's not having those, why aren't kids graduating from high school, what can we do to help them succeed, is actually part of an anti-suicide uh, approach. Um, we've tried to collect these, as I said, in some useful documents. This document, Promoting Health and Cost Control in States, was actually uh, funded uh, in part by Kaiser Permanente. And what it did is we searched 1,500 policies that had an evidence base looking for the ones that had the strongest evidence base for uh, if they could be adopted as laws at the state level would result in a relatively short time in improved health and cost reduction. 
Much of the improved health is related to some of the risk factors associated with suicide. We came up with 13 of those policies that look at everything from income, housing, um, and uh, safety. Uh, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, it's, you can Google it. Um, uh, P-H-A-C-C-S is how we refer to it, or FACS. Uh, Kaiser Permanente also supports a city version of this that's known as City Health, which promotes nine policies that are evidence-based at the city level that, if implemented, will create conditions which reduce those stressors that are more likely to put people at elevated risk for, um, for suicide. Uh, and the CDC also has a, another example of that, again, as a resource to help you, that's known as High Five, or Health Impact in Five Years or Less. It summarizes the evidence and presents policies with language um, that uh, can be used at multiple levels, city, county, local, and if put in place, has the advantage of reaching large segments of the population and really working at that primordial or primary population level. This is just a couple of examples of what those policies are that have been shown to have a strong connection to reducing the risk factors. Our earned income tax credits, for example, by reducing the impact of poverty has actually been shown in a relatively short amount of time to have a positive impact on overall health and can contribute to the work that's being done in multiple sectors around a suicide prevention. Uh, similarly, fair hiring practices, this one highlights the practice, the uh, policy known as ban the box, uh, eliminating the discrimination that can come where people are coming out of correctional facilities and can't find jobs uh, is part of this overall approach that looks at the, the underlying factors or primordial factors. So in conclusion, I would just say, uh, again, where I started. This is too big a problem to try to solve in one location. It's too big of a problem for clinicians to have on their shoulders. We have to think about excellent clinical care, the screening, the referrals that we heard of earlier, but we also have to think about how do we create healthful communities where people are connected to each other in positive ways, where we work against discrimination, we work against bullying, and we try to eliminate some of the conditions like poverty and racism, which can significantly increase the risk factors. Thanks. John, thank you. Um, it's, you know, it's always a pleasure to have um, a public health leader like John join us um, on an event like this. I, I get in a side bit of my work is to do some public health work with the Public Health Institute and other organizations. And when I told a couple of my colleagues there that John would be joining us on this, um, this forum, they were, they were very excited for me. So thank you for being here. Um, our, our next presenter is Nathaniel Counts. Uh, Nathaniel is actually a mainstay of our mental health forums um, that we've had here at the Center for Total Health. I think you've been at all of the forums that we've had here and a frequent participant and excellent contributor. So thanks again, Nathaniel, for being here. Um, Nathaniel is Associate Vice President of Policy for Mental Health America, um, works on innovative federal and state policy solutions for problems in behavioral health, focuses on issues um, in incentive alignment and sustainable financing in behavioral health care and issues on population health, Recent publication I won't get into. You might talk about that. Um, is a you know don't hold it against him or any of the rest of us who are trained as lawyers. But he trained as a, he uh, uh, is a graduate of the Harvard Law School, and, where he was a Petri Flom Center for Health Law Policy student fellow, um, and got your bachelor's degree in biology from Johns Hopkins. So welcome. Thanks. Great to have you. Thanks so Thanks much, Tony. Okay. Um, oh, where's my little clicker guy? Oh, this guy. The big green button, I think. Ah, that makes sense. Right. Okay, wonderful. Um, and so collusion is a hot topic in DC at the moment, and John and I colluded a little bit on our presentations. <laughs> um, so while he did uh, social determinants of health and context matters, and here's state and city solutions, mine's going to focus what can we hear in DC, you know, sometimes hundreds or thousands of miles away from the people we're trying to help, with federal policy solutions to affect these social contexts. Um, and in doing so, I don't want to say healthcare reform isn't important. Like, healthcare reform is clearly important. I put up a lazy list of examples of things we could definitely do tomorrow um, for any kind of behavior trying to incentivize around suicide risk prevention, like 
um, safety plan assessment and screening and uh, completion, we can make that a quality measure and begin measuring it and capturing it and promoting it. Um, we could have value-based payment models that look at things we care about. Um, we could use the vast ma uh, machinery of CMS that has like, these quality improvement organizations and qualified entities to push on um, better outcomes for people around depression and mental health. Um, just like an easy example, if you guys have looked at the NCQA HEDIS database, um, one of the measures is follow-up after hospitalization for initial mental illness. Um, the national rate is like about 40% successful follow-up. Uh, that's, that's not great if, we, if that's a major risk factor. So we could push on that. Um, another example, in the Medicare Series Savings Program, the median rate of depression remission at 12 months for ACOs reporting in is 8.7%. The median rate of random remission for depression at 12 months is 53%. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of work to be done within healthcare to get these numbers to line up. Um, but what I really want to focus on is the opportunities to stop it from getting that far and the sort of social context that we know matters. Um, and the thing I want to start with is the single most obvious solution is to start in healthcare and screen people for social determinants of health and refer out. Um, just, I think, a, two months ago in American Journal of uh, Public Health, Community Rx, which is, I think, probably the largest and most well-developed study of social needs screening and referral, just completed its evaluation. Um, it was like a many million dollars CMMI project. And so what it did was it looked at, um, at every intake, you filled out a social needs questionnaire, and it had a database of all the different community-based organizations in the community, and it would give you a personalized referral database um, so you could go meet your social needs. And they found that at the three-month follow-up, people's knowledge of community resources doubled, and about 50% of people told their friends about community resources, so they really were genuinely internalizing the resources. Um, there was no statistically significant effect size on health-related quality of life, either mental or physical. And if you look at a little bit deeper the data, it actually trended negative. Um, people seemed slightly worse off in the intervention group. Um, the conclusion was, and it could be there's a bunch of problems, like maybe three months isn't enough time and you need more time to follow up, or something else happened. But the conclusion from the authors was that we likely need a higher intensity intervention, um, and we need to make sure that the resources meet needs. And what I really want to touch on today is that to make a really meaningful impact in people's lives, um, we should probably focus on the institutions that govern people's social lives outside of healthcare. Um, and make sure that those are equipped and fully capacitated to meet people's needs, um, rather than hoping that through healthcare referrals alone we can address all the social context for people. Um, part of that too is how many of people here are familiar with, and I guess you can kind of raise your hands if you know, uh, the Whitehall study, like the original social determinants of health study, yeah. So we've got some public healthy folks. So uh, in the social needs world, often we screen for and refer to discrete social determinants of health, like housing and food and um, whatever kinds of other needs we have. Uh, what the Whitehall study found was for the people, civil servants in England and UK, um, even though they all had roughly the same access to high quality health care and they also all had this huge benefits package, people's health still almost perfectly correlated with their income. Um, and unpacking that over decades, what they found was the major determinant wasn't sort of like absolute resource access or deprivation. It was your perceived sense of social control. Um, and the, apparently in replications, and don't quote me on this, uh, like they found, I think it was like the Grammy Award winner lives statistically longer than the Grammy runner-up or something like that. It's like, it, apparently like in replications, like you actually find this like in very fine green too. And it's, I think uh, perceived sense of control affects our immune system, affects our health-related uh, behaviors. Um, so I think part of our strategy has to be not only making sure we're meeting these discrete needs, but also the norm change interventions that leads to uh, building everyone's perceived sense of control and value as well. Um, so what I wanted to touch on is often the social context for suicide feels like incredibly nebulous and like how on earth do we affect that? Um, and there are actually are like major laws in every single area of social determinant that I think do both affect like both people's absolute access to resources but also the norms that govern their lives. And that we as healthcare stakeholders can and should lobby on this. Um, and just to put up like a little bit finer point, I think our dalliances into other sectors of health and social needs um, are pretty effective because healthcare is actually one of the strongest lobbies in the United States. Um, you know, if you look at it, it's like US Chamber of Commerce, the National Realtors Association, then a list of healthcare entities. And so I think we, you know, when we sort of combine efforts and aren't 
um, you know, if it's trying to work on the healthcare pie itself, but trying to work on social terms of health, I think we can be hugely impactful. Um, and for me, you know, I spend all my time in energy and commerce and finance and everything, and this is kind of a call for all of us to wander over to the other committees and see how they're doing as well. Um, okay, so I just wanted to touch on some case studies and just four examples. The first one is the easiest, which is school. Um, we heard about good behavior game, we heard about trauma-informed schools. Um, we're sort of like already headed in the right direction on that one. So our three major authorizing statutes are Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is Title I's funding for low-income schools and Title IV funding for professional development dollars, all these sort of things that um, drive federal resources into under-resourced schools. Then we have Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which governs um, individualized education programs, all the sort of web of needs for children um, that require additional help. And then Higher Education Act, which actually is both the conditions for college students, but also the training that teachers receive when they go into schools. Um, so there's kind of two levers there. And increasingly, for the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, there's a focus on the non-academic indicators and non-academic grant programs. And so with the most recent bill, um, Every Student Succeeds Act, it was sort of like the first foray into non-academic things and not just having like strictly reading math accountability. And I think when the next authorization is up, which is next year, I think, um, we could continue to press on that to make sure that schools have what they need to uh, implement effective mental health, social emotional learning interventions, good behavior game uh, system-wide. Then workplace. So, and this was actually new to me. I was reading section 29 of the US code for the first time, which is all the labor laws. Um, and so we actually, and you kind of think like in your head, you're like, I don't think there's a big federal role for labor here, because we kind of hear about often that, um, but we do have labor standards. We have ERISA, which governs benefits. Um, we have Occupational Safety and Health, and we have this Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which is all the job training programs. And I think one of the biggest difference between when a lot of these bills were passed and today was these were all sort of forged in the fires of like the labor movement versus the robber barons and protecting the rights of individuals. Today, though, I think we've kind of taken, at least increasingly, taking on a different viewpoint that mental health and productivity are related and that the interests of both employees and employers are aligned. Um, and I think that shifting empirical science underlying mental health, suicide, pro workplace productivity allows for new kinds of policies to be co-developed um, among the stakeholders uh, if we work together to integrate that empirical science. Then for occupational safety and health, you know, that was designed to stop people from being exposed to chemicals or dangerous machinery. But imagine if we added in like psychological safety and well-being as a key function of occupational safety and health. I think it would fundamentally transform the way we view workplace, suicide, adult health. Um, and for Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, one of the biggest problems is, uh, you know, job loss is a major uh, predictor of suicide. Um, and it's, it's viewed not only as like a sort of financial insecurity issue, but also as like a failure, a personal failing, right, that sort of makes you feel like you have no more options. And so I think the, one of the opportunities there is to better press on connecting people leaving jobs with immediate retraining and making it kind of like normative to get retrained and reengaged rather than getting fired, having to hunt down your unemployment benefits, having to hunt down eventually a job training program, and the kind of like log slog towards reintegration. I think there's chances to tinker with all of these to change the norms around labor, reemployment, everything around mental health. Um, then this sort of combines two ideas. So this is uh, both community development, so the macro level of financing, what does low income housing tax credits look like, and the kind of like subtle behind the scenes levers that shape the built environment around us, but then also consumer uh, protection. So we have all the, um, you know, Elizabeth Warren's big Consumer Finance Protection Bureau and the protections that came after the financial crisis and the opportunities there. And I think um, just an easy example is right now the Housing and Community Development Act and the Community Renewal Tax Relief Act, which are each billions of dollars for community development projects are only tied to low income and economic prosperity, but don't consider the mental health um, and suicide prevention aspects of it. And I think that by mainstreaming the considerations around mental health, suicide prevention into these kind of built environment interventions, we could more fundamentally transform the conditions of people's lives. Um, and then I one last question. Okay, so this is the one that to me seems the most intractable from an initial pass, which is like family relationships, social isolation. 
Um, we know that relationship problems are a serious determinant. What on earth are we to do from the federal perspective? Um, weirdly enough, the Deficit Reduction and Claims Resolution Acts both contained huge marriage programs. Um, and so, which is odd, that, so health systems across America that got these grants are running free marriage counseling programs, basically. And they have pretty good effects, but they're not widespread or even slightly normative. Um, but they do show good effects on reducing intimate partner violence, and uh, I think probably you could find they reduce suicide. Um, then Family Violence Prevention and Services Act is the, the domestic violence clinics that are all across America, which unquestionably reduce you know, thousands of suicide by giving people options. Um, and then the Preventive Health Amendments, which is part of what develops the Injury Prevention Center at CDC, which does um, intimate partner violence and then child maltreatment and all the other sorts of parts. And I think there, my big point would be, these are great starts. These are clearly not like the final answer, though. Um, we have a handful of challenging to reach relationship interventions, and none of them get to like the larger context of like social inclusion, belonging, community, and only intervene in certain, ki certain kinds of like normative relationships that are cognizable failures, um, like upcoming divorce, but not the sort of like more malleable parts of modern life. Um, and so I think part of what we could do is press on new approaches that build norms around social inclusion, uh, make it more normal to seek social opportunities and admit that you're lonely and all of that. And the UK has sort of started going down this route. Um, it's mostly older adults focused, but I think part of what this all the research shows that it's cross-cutting across all ages. Um, and I am way over time, but I think I would just say um, we can and should address social determinants of health using federal legislation. Um, and as healthcare stakeholders, uh, we have opportunities. It just takes abnormal amounts of creativity to figure out how to uh, translate this onto the ground. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nathaniel. Okay, so we have about 20 minutes for some discussion and, and questions, so I will ask anyone who has thoughts and questions to uh, step up to the microphone. And um, I'm sure, I know many of you, Nathaniel did give us the tour de force of every possible federal <laughs> intervention, and so if anybody has a favorite, they should step up and vote for that. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I, was, I think I was hearing as a theme through all of your conversations um, really has to do with resourcing. And, and how under-resourced it seems like this problem is at, at every level. Um, so I don't know if, you know, at thinking about either as a local level, a state level, or a federal level, are there things that we should be focusing on um, to try to tap into some of the resources that do exist and can be turned in this direction a little bit better? I don't know if that's a helpful way to start the conversation. Could I, maybe I'll, I'd start in that. I, you know, I, I think that you know we, we've we've really emphasized the critical importance of the healthcare system. I I would say that uh, equally important in terms of addressing this issue is the public health system. Right. But the public health system, exemplified by John and people in every local community and and the states, it doesn't have any specialized resources for the most part to deal with the complicated issues that we're addressing. Public health can be the glue, importantly, that brings together uh, health care with these other sectors we say so are important, from the faith community to other governmental sectors, uh, transportation, job opportunity, education. Get them at the table, make sure the data is presented, present the evidence, and then get people working together. So what we've done at Trust for America's Health is we now have a proposal before Congress and with the administration that would get uh, every state health department a unit that could work on these kind of activities in collaboration with the large uh, health care providers and, and the other sectors that are key. You, you can't do that without resources. Somebody's got to really work hard to get folks at the table and to get them the resources they need. Yeah, that's helpful. I would just uh, echo that, and I think uh, that's one of the things we're attempting to do without additional funds with the Action Alliance is pull together the various state agencies with business and others and take a look at what resources we can actually maybe think about using in a different way. Um, you know, whether that's the Department of Commerce as well, uh, Department of Children, Youth, and Families, and what are those opportunities um, that are out there. But core funding for this sort of basic uh, convening work and policy development work uh, really is something that 
many states are working on. We have an approach that we're call, calling foundational public health services, where we're trying to fund essentially those really core uh, pieces that are not funded uh, because people fund a grant to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say one of the critical things, too, is getting aggressive and unified about the economics of human development so we can better understand and reinvest savings. Like, the good behavior game is estimated, it's like return on investments like 35 to 1 or something. If that was a bond, it would be like we would all invest in that, right? right? right. Um, but, I mean, so you guys have the Washington State Institute for Public Policy. Most everyone else has... Uh, nothing, unfortunately. Um, so I think getting figuring out that and mainstreaming that math would help a lot with the investment. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nathaniel, one of the things that you mentioned, and I'm going to ask this because it presses on some of our plans as an organization. You know, it's it's viewed as a progressive and and stretching kind of activity to do work to screen and try to link people to the social services that are available. You made the point, um, or John, maybe you made the point that that's great but it doesn't really get into the underneath and there's questions about the effectiveness. And I'm wondering if that's about the capacity of the system itself to actually perform at that need or if it's, you know, if it's something else. Because if, as we go down this road, we want to make sure that we're providing the appropriate support to the system as well as it's trying to meet needs. I didn't know if there was more to amplify about that. Um, and I, to be honest, until I saw that study, I thought for sure that was going to work. I mean, so I don't think it's intuitive at all that that wasn't going to work. And I think it's like, kind of like... Uh, touch with reality moment where we need to figure out because it the conclusion of the study wasn't even necessarily that the referrals weren't effective it was that, like the process of linkaging was stressing people out um, hmm. so it seems like we just need to keep iterating on the linkaging system and, and there's probably I mean for sure there's also like a uh, strong start at the big perinatal health intervention uh, found that the enhanced social screening increased rates of preterm birth uh, which can't be good but, and part of the reason was they made calls and they found out that women were being put on like seven-year housing wait lists. Um, so there's definitely problems with the capacity of the system, but I think there's also we just need to do additional work iterating on the linkages. Well, but I, I would say that the, we, we need the experience from Kaiser Permanente and other providers that in the screening are identifying what, what would help. Yeah. Because some of it is clearly referral to an appropriate clinician. But some of it is people might say, y you know, I'm, my, my housing situation is really a major problem now that's contributing to the stress that's making me more likely to uh, uh, think of, have suicidal ideas or, or other mental health issues or substance abuse issues. If we have the data from that if, that could say, well, we've identified a shortfall in you know, let's say Washington, D.C., of 5,000 units, affordable units, from the data, then that's a plan, that can be used for planning purposes. But there's no getting around. We have to think about supply and not just need. Because right. if we're identifying need and it stops there, then it, it frustrates the clinician as well as the, the patient. We, we've got to put, pay attention to that, and, and that isn't being paid attention to now. One of the things I'll be interested in looking at is uh, with the healthcare transformation work and the CMI innovation grants, sort of where some of these accountable community of health structures are able to get, uh, where we're really bringing together healthcare delivery system with housing, with uh, employment, with social service agencies, um, to see um, if we really can get to this upper stream social determinants of health. The reality is we do need some core funding to do this work, but in lieu of that, we're also needing to come together and figure out how we work differently across our sectors. And I think healthcare folks are as frustrated as we are with the lack of these uh, kind of resources and effective um, systems. So uh, I'll be curious to see, you know, what the results show from the from the actually the many experiments that are out there across the state or across the country. That's great. That's helpful. I think we do have a question, actually. Hi, John Rich from Drexel University in Philadelphia. I just want to thank you for this is one of the most thoughtful and actually practical conversations about the social determinants of health from a policy perspective that I've heard. I do want to, uh, and I appreciate the discussion about firearms because certainly with regard to suicide, we, we know that's a is a critical area and recognizing that the second amendment is what it is but doesn't constrain us to regulate 
Do you have ideas about which of the, of the panoply of possible regulatory strategies around suicide, which you believe might be the most effective? And I, I realize that often is an uncomfortable question. I feel a bit uncomfortable asking it for reasons that are partly about the intimidation that come from it. But if not that, then how do we, are there opportunities to better understand that if we don't know it's given the constraints about research? So. Well, I think, you know, there's some common sense approaches out there that I think if you do the, the public polling shows that the public uh, thinks makes sense, whether it is about restricting access to firearms for those who have domestic violence um, uh, histories or mental health or are in crisis. And I think what we've seen in Washington state is our citizens are saying those common sense things need to become law and, you know, they're making it happen through the initiative process. Um, because, you know, uh, even if you uh, consider Washington a blue state, which I'd say it's actually much more purple than people realize, um, you know, we weren't able to get those things uh, through the legislature. Um, so I would look to those things that I think, you know, even, even firearm owners say make sense. Um, you know, I, I'd say from an from a, um, evidence-based perspective, fewer firearms are, are lead to fewer firearm-related uh, injuries, uh, intentional or unintentional. So, so just from an evidence-based perspective, not, not talking about politics, if there are laws that are in place which make guns less um, available to people, you, you will have fewer um, uh, suicides from firearms. Um, uh, that's po obviously politically not always possible, but um, but I think it's important for us as uh, people who are engaged in the sciences to really talk about the science. And the science would say fewer means less availability. Now, if that's not a possibility, thinking about the ways of restricting it by certain populations certainly that makes sense. Thinking about restricting certain types of weapons makes sense, and thinking about the kind of protective lock and counseling that we heard earlier this morning makes sense. But the bottom line is, when it comes to opioids, when we're thinking about appropriate prescribing practices, we're talking about fewer opioids being circulated in the public and available to the public. Uh, we're not telling people, get as many opioids, just lock them up and use them wisely. We, we realize that it doesn't work that way. You really have to think about the availability of, of the, um, the um, what is, re what is used as the tool to, uh, uh, that results in suicide. Okay. Another question. I just wanted to say thank you because I thought this panel was amazing and I feel like I learned a lot. I wish it was like another hour long, but it's not. Um, but my question has to do with this real practical opportunity, you know, just like you were saying with the practice. Another a major opportunity has to do with um, extending the mental health workforce. Mm -hmm. There aren't enough mental health providers, and not everyone's receptive to a mental health provider. So thinking about peer navigation models, such as Keita Franklin was um, talking about with the VA, like in the VA system, they can implement these innovative things like that. And even though the billing for these providers may not be totally worked out, they can play a massive role in supporting patients and helping them connect with services. Um, practical services in their community, um, firearm safety, counseling, you know, from more of a peer, not like the top-down type approach, like I'm your doctor and I'm telling you what to do. And so this type of peer-to-peer -peer model um, hasn't been broadly disseminated, but for suicide prevention, it makes a lot of sense. And in connecting the dots for these patients that can't do it on their own. And so I think we should also be thinking about that type of approach and you know, adding that to our toolbox, so to speak. I fully agree with that, and thank you for bringing that up. And I think uh, two things come to my mind uh, in this area. 
One is, thankfully, where we are going with health transformation work and sort of paying for outcomes rather than specific sort of individual services allows an environment where we can bring in a sort of more creative um, kinds of workforce and um, have them paid, whether those are in, you know, bundled payment kinds of things or um, just different payment schemes so that it isn't about needing to have a, you know, scope of practice that is approved by the legislature and that you can actually bill for. So I think that's a positive thing moving forward. And as an agency, uh, John, I think, I don't, did you regulate health professions in Massachusetts? Yeah. So um, as the Secretary of Health, I've really learned a whole lot about health professions and regulating them. Um, uh, but we're stuck with things that we have to figure out as well, like background checks and like really what should be something that would disqualify someone you know we're looking for lived experience folks um, and so sometimes with lived experience comes history um, history that you know um, uh, our current systems basically say eh, you know you can't get that license I think we have to really think through um, how we better do that and how we work with organizations um, who are employing folks um, uh, that might have a criminal background history of theft or um, other, you know, substance use uh, histories then, uh, that um, allows us to make sure we get a workforce that actually has the lived experience and is safe at the same time. I'd also add that another advantage to the model you were just uh, mentioning is it has a greater likelihood that the people being trained would reflect the racial, ethnic, and linguistic composition of yep. the communities. And that right now, though, that, they're real barriers to people getting services because they, they may not speak the same language as the, the clinicians who are available to, to see patients. Um, and so we, 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 we need them to overcome some of um, those barriers, while at the same time we should be d training at all levels a more diverse workforce in, in, in the interim. This is uh, important, I think, of not losing whole segments of the population that otherwise wouldn't have access. And uh, peer support is just uh, added as a supplemental benefit in Medicare Advantage, and pending with Ways and Means is a policy proposal to add peers to traditional Medicare, so come join us in that fight. <laughs> that's great. I, I mean, that's a great point. I think, Nathaniel, you'll agree with me that the various sessions that we've had um, or particularly around mental health, um, this topic has come up intensively in every single one of those meetings. That it's, it's not just around suicide prevention, it's about access to mental health services, it's about the right types of services being available, it's about the limitations on payment of um, what therapists, what, what social workers can do in schools as opposed to being freely available to the environment in those schools. Um, so I think this is a, that's a really important question and something where I think there's a lot of work for us to try to do together in that space. Hi, Hi Bill Arnone with Go the ahead. National Academy of Social Insurance. My question is for Dr. Weissman. Uh, the state of Washington has been a leader in promoting policies to support caregiving and caregivers, uh, paid family leave being one of them. Did you see any correlation between the stresses of caregiving and suicide rates and was that a driver in the promotion of caregiving policies? Um, I don't think that was a driver um, in those policies. It was really, I think, uh, more about what we thought was doing right. I think th all the benefits that might be there include that. Um, but uh, we've really, I think, uh, tried to move in this case of you know, paid family leave and other policies that we think make for a good economy and make for sort of uh, healthier populations. Uh, all together sort of just come for good health. So there are many reasons to do these things. Thank you. Pavan? Do we have time for another question? We absolutely do. <laughs> Fire away. Yeah, so um, first of all, just a quick comment. The, um, the state of Washington suicide prevention plan is amazing. Um, and even though it's not yet funded, it's 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 a it's a guidebook for us for for us to follow it, what to do in primary care and special behavioral health care. So I just encourage everyone if you get a chance to to read through it. It's not short. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, I was curious about um, you know we we all we all know that we need to have more mental health providers, not um, creating enough. Um, I will say that um, today um, I've spent about. Um, twice the amount of time learning about suicide um, than I did in training as a psychiatry resident. Mm. And so we can, I guess, 
create more mental health providers, but I, I wonder if there's a role in making sure that all providers have a core competency. Um, how can we do that and make sure that our providers know about suicide prevention so that we're, like, when, we, when our providers come in um, Northwest Permanente, we spend a day training them on it um, uh, with stuff they haven't learned before, so. Well, that really was the driver for the legislation in Washington, which mandated this uh, continuing education requirement for the healthcare providers that uh, were noted and that we've been expanding. Um, it started out just sort of requiring training, and then we basically had to certify like that the training was like decent training. Um, and I think over time, we'll keep looking to build um, on that with uh, more in-depth training. Um, that really gives uh, providers the tools, I think, truly that they need, whether it's DBT or other, other uh, kinds of um, training for particular um, categories of health professionals. But, but, but to hear you say that yeah. is like just yeah. shocking, isn't it, right? Yeah. Because know, it's like, yeah. wow, really? A psychiatrist yeah. with little training in suicide? Yeah. It really suggests that part of what we sh the work we should be doing at the national level as well as in states is uh, talking to the <laughs> the medical schools, the nursing yeah. schools, social work schools, to make sure the curricula uh, have uh, components uh, that are offered to all the students that, that help them to uh, better understand how to uh, uh, screen for and address the issues. And my and, sense of like the policy imp uh, implications of like accrediting bodies is if you can like throw out a little bit of grant dollars to get like a certain number of medical schools up to speed on training, then that gives like the board, the accrediting body, like enough coverage to like say that at least now enough schools are doing it that they can change the accreditation standards and then everyone else follows suit and there's a whole dance, I think, in there to do. <laughs> and I think it is better now, but um, it's still not good enough. You know, like, I, I graduated 10 years ago, so it, it wasn't on the forefront of people's minds then. Well, um, Don and I will take this up with the uh, leadership of our new medical school yeah. soon yeah. Uh, to see what we can do ourselves yeah. to try to lead the way there. Yeah. Well, um, I hope all of you will join me in thanking the panel. This has been terrific. Thank you guys.